those of y'all don't know me, my name is Mr. Larson. I'm the program director for combatives. And what we're going to talk about today is competitions. Since we have the midterms coming up and they're sort of a competition, I want you to understand why we're doing it that way and, and understand the role of competitions and how they play out in combatives programs. And more importantly than that, we're also going to talk about values. That's actually kind of the main point, right? We're going to get to about, about how all these things affect values, okay? And, and what does that even mean when we say that these are our values, right? This is something we value. Everybody kind of understand I get out? Like the Army gives you a list of things. They say, look, value these things. These are the Army values. But really what values are, they're the things that you actually place value on, right? The attributes of each other that you actually place value on. So how do we affect those? What's going on? So before we get started, let's talk and set up a little bit about the 507th Maintenance Unit. Has anybody, any of y'all ever heard of that? The 507th Maintenance Unit? A few of y'all? How about Jessica Lynch? Some of y'all heard of her as well? She was a member of that unit. She was one of the first female POWs. And if you hadn't heard the story, basically, here's the story. They, they were a maintenance unit. I don't know what they were supposed to maintain. It's not pertinent to the story, except that they never got a chance to because on the initial push up to Baghdad, they got lost and then their unit got separated and then a portion of the unit got ambushed and everyone killed or captured. Now, there's lots of information you can find from this. The Army did a great AAR about it, all the things that went into this debacle. And many members of the organization have done, uh, elect, I mean, have done uh, interviews and whatnot, so you can hear what they had to say about it. And, but I find that the most interesting thing about the entire incident was this. Every single weapon in the unit, Every single one, every rifle, pistol, machine gun, etc. Every single weapon in the unit malfunctioned when they were in that fight. Now think about that for a second. How does every single weapon in an organization fail to operate? Well, clearly they weren't doing weapons maintenance, right? I mean, that was what was going on. But, but, but that unit had leaders, didn't they? They had a company commander, they had a first sergeant, they had an XO, they had platoon leaders, they had platoon sergeants, they had squad leaders, they had all of that stuff. And yet they didn't do any weapons maintenance? Like not just one or two, or like the majority, none of them, right? And what that tells you is that there was a systemic failure, like a cultural failure in those leaders, in that group of leaders. Now, what was that failure? Well, if you listen to Jessica Lynch's interview, she explains it. She came in like, right, either the day before or the day after 9-11, right? She, she was, went to basic training, went to AIT, showed up in her unit, the unit deployed to Kuwait, and then they kicked off on the, uh, over the berm into Iraq, right? And she says that in all that time, from the first day of basic training all the way until they were actually in the fight, no one in her chain of command, no leader, had ever told her that she might be the one doing the fighting. In fact, they had told her exactly the opposite. We're a maintenance unit. You're a maintainer. Other people do the fighting, right? You can almost imagine that unit doing their field problems before the war, right? They're probably like non-tactical convoy out to the woods, set up their tents, put like a single strand of concertina wire around there, you know, so nobody would wander in keep stray dogs out or something, and then like one person staying up at night, and then they practiced maintaining whatever it was they were supposed to maintain in a field environment, and they thought that that was getting ready for war because other people were going to do the fighting, right? Okay, so turns out that wasn't true at all. But we had a problem in the Army in those days that we recognized because of that incident. The Army was bifurcated. We thought there were combat jobs, and non-combat jobs, you know, combat MOSs, combat branches, non-combat MOSs, non-combat branches. That's the way thought, okay? Well, that isn't true at all. In fact, that way of thinking is what led to that debacle, right? Now, this is a reoccurring theme. It happens when we have long periods of peace because large amounts of people in the Army don't want to face the fact that they're going to have to do the fighting. Right? And we like to like, imagine different parts of the army and think how far away that would be from combat. So think about that for a second. What's the portion of the army that's farthest away from combat, as you could imagine? 
You know, normally when I ask that question, people come up with like cyber or space command or something like that, right? Okay, so what about cyber? How do you suppose the enemy is communicating with each other on the modern battlefield? Right, do you think it's radios? Right? How about using the internet? Just like everybody else in the world communicates. Just like you communicate with your family and everybody else, right? So well, you know what that tells you? That tells you cyber is down in the infantry battalions. That's how immediate it is. Space Command, what do they do? Well, they do a bunch of stuff, but one thing they do is things like jam GPSs. Imagine the strength of signal from a, G from a satellite to your GPS device of time. Not too hard to jam, right? But that's the sort of stuff they do. And you know what that tells you, both of those things? Those people, along with the field laundry, along with everybody else in the Army, one thing they definitely do is move around the battlefield. And what happens when you move around the battlefield? Enemy action. That's what happens. Right? So when you're in that convoy and you're in vehicle number four and the lead vehicle gets blown off the map and everybody burned alive, what are you going to do? Hemmed in by terrain or something? You're going to get off that vehicle and take down buildings because it turns out you're a provisional infantryman just like everybody else in the army. And that's not the time to figure it out, right? So, so how do we get there, you know? Well, let me tell you another story, kind of, kind of, so if you see where I'm going here. Once upon a time, we had the chief of staff of the Army and the sergeant major of the Army and their respective entourages all together in the Army Combative School. It was actually before it was the Army Combative School, right? And there was a big group. It was probably like this size group, maybe, maybe 40 people or something like that. So I asked the group, who's the best runner here in this organization? And they all knew. They were immediately like, oh, yeah, Major Longlegs. He just won the Marine Corps Marathon or some similar story, right? And I was like, oh, that's great. You know, big fan of fitness. I'm glad this guy's such a great runner and that everybody knows it. Okay, so who's the best shot? And now there were crickets, right? Like nobody had a clue who the best shot was. And I said, okay, well, who's the best fighter? Once again, nobody had any idea who the best fighter was. So what I told them then was, okay, so what you've told me is that in this unit, you have selected running as more important than shooting and fighting. And they couldn't argue with that because they clearly all knew who the best runner was because they valued it, right? They valued running ability. They didn't know who the best shot was or the best fighter was because even if they gave lip service to valuing it, they didn't actually value it. You see my point, right? Now the question is, why? How did they get these values? It's not like they had a committee meeting, right? Nobody said, okay, who here votes running is more important? And like 17 hands came up. Now how about shooting? And that was only four hands. And then how about fighting? And like only one guy over there outside, you know, wrestled in high school. That was the guy. No, it wasn't that at all, right? What happened? What happened was every morning, just like the rest of the army, they fell out for PT, right? Tension, right face, forward march, double time. And what happens on that run? About a mile into it or so, the first person starts to fall back, right? And what do we all think of that person? And the truth is, I don't even have to mention what we think about it because everybody sitting here knows what we think about that person. And even that turd wishes some other turd would fall out first so they wouldn't be the one that's getting humiliated like that, right? because that's what's really going on. It turns out that that run is actually an informal competition. It's a social event, right? We go out on this run and everybody must go. It's a unit run, right? And there's the threat of public humiliation associated with the event. Because if you fall out of the run, you're that guy, right? Now, I wanna make sure we're clear here. Because this is the army, all of you have to know that that's real. It's not that like I'm making it up and I'm some harsh guy, right? The truth is this, if you get to your platoon, when you're a platoon leader and you fall out of your run, you're gonna be publicly humiliated. So don't, you must be a good enough runner to handle that position or you're gonna destroy your ability to lead that platoon. 
right? That's why you need to be fit. You need to be fit enough to be able to have standing in that platoon so you can be respected, right? So that is an informal competition every time you do it, okay? And the informal competitions have some features that you should know and be able to recognize, okay? One of them I already mentioned already, which was that everybody must take part, right? Not everybody can get out of PT. You, in fact, you can't get out of it all the time. You're going to be a soldier for a long time. Eventually, you're going to be doing unit PT, okay? That's one feature. You must do it. Second, there's the threat of public humiliation. Like, if you fall out of that run, you're going to be humiliated. But there's also the promise of public accolades, right? What happens if two miles into that run and the leader says, okay, release, and everybody runs back to where you started, right? The rabbits will take off. And everybody wishes they was one of those rabbits, right? I mean, maybe not enough to do the PT, you know, to be one of those rabbits, but you get the idea. Everybody in the army wishes they were a better runner because social status is attached to it, right? You do better in the army if you're a better runner. We value running ability. Everybody kind of get the idea, right? Okay. So how would we capture that dynamic with the other things we mentioned, with marksmanship? Well, how about this? Last time you went to the range, who knew how you did? Because most of the time in the army, the answer to that is you, the person who helped you finger whip the score, and then maybe the clerk, right? And the only thing that gets reported up the chain of the command usually is like numbers, right? We had this many people not pass in first platoon. Get the idea, right? Well, how would that dynamic change if when you came back from the range, you posted all the scores? What would go down then? Well, the answer is we'd know what would happen, right? Everybody would walk up to the list in the company area, scroll down to the bottom, see who was the worst shot in the company, and go, Larson, you shot a 14. Why do we even give you a rifle, right? Like, you suck at this. We should make you carry heavy shit for the people who can shoot because clearly you're not one of them, right? That's what would go down. And then, how would that affect training in the unit? Because next time we went to the rifle range, everybody would remember that, right? And nobody would want to be that person. And so everybody would take it a little more seriously. There wouldn't anybody be going out there just lackadaisically, just, ah, it doesn't matter, blah, 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 shoot their 14, come back and take their humiliation. Get the idea, right? By posting the scores, we would have made it into an informal competition. As simple as that. And because we did, people would take it more seriously. Okay? Just the way they take running. And then that unit would be able to tell me because right there at the top would be the same name. And this guy might be the best shot every single time he's the one, right? And we give him some sort of accolades for that. And next thing you know, we actually value marksmanship. Okay? Now, how about fighting? How would we do it with fighting? Well, the short answer is we got to get people fighting. Okay? If people aren't fighting, you're not going to know who's good at it. Simple as that. Now, I want to give you a kind of example of how we used to do it in the Ranger Battalions back when this all started. Sort of the Neanderthal way. You can do it this way if you like, but I'll give you some other examples. Of that. But I just want you to understand the dynamic here, right? In 2nd Ranger Battalion, where all this stuff started, we used to have what's called payday activities. So this is before the internet, right? So we used to have on payday, we'd have a big formation, so everybody get their checks, and then you'd get the day off and you'd go pay bills because you had to go to the electric place or whatever, or put all the stuff in the mail and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, at that formation, the battalion sergeant major would get up on the podium, right, and call people out at random. He'd be like, give me the first squad leader, first platoon, Alpha Company, and the second squad leader, second platoon, Bravo Company. And those two guys would fall out, eh, run up to the front of the battalion, and fight. Okay? So, I want you to imagine what that would do to the culture of the unit. Because everybody's standing there every time knowing they may be the one called, right? Yeah, and here's how it works out. Over at Alpha Company, there's this guy, right? This is the proverbial, I would just shoot you guy, right? I want you to make note that this is 30 years ago, and I'm still making fun of this guy, okay? Because it's funny. He's to be made fun of. So with that being said, I would just shoot you guy over there running his mouth. I would just shoot you. This command stuff is stupid, blah, 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 right? Okay, then he gets called, and he runs up in front of the whole battalion. And then that guy from Charlie Company twists him up like, closing the bread with him or something, or like he's that last piece of paper and he's finished with it, right? And then what happens? And then he's got to run back and take charge of his squad again. Outed. 
right? Outed, because everybody in the entire battalion now knows he's just a smack-talking pansy. And all that stuff was just to cover up for the fact that he's not a good fighter. Right? That's what goes down. So how many times do you think that has to happen? How about once? One time. That happens one time and everyone realizes it is not socially acceptable to be that guy. And that problem goes away. Even that guy, what does he do? He starts training because he's got to redeem himself, right? It's like if you fall out of a run, what do you got to do? Get in better shape. Don't fall out of any more. Become one of the better runners. You can totally redeem yourself, right? But that's how you have to do it. Same with that guy. That's like when one of your soldiers falls out. What do, you, what do you think? When you're in charge of a formation, one of your soldiers falls out. What do you do? You identify that they need leadership, right? And then you apply leadership and get them to be a better runner. That's what you do, right? Same with the guy who can't fight. Anyway, you understand the idea. You have to get people fighting. Once you get people fighting, then fighting ability starts to be valued. So I'll give you another example of how it actually works, right? Remember the last class when we came in here and we scrapped for like half the class? Not, what was going down when we were doing that? Well, there were a couple things. Number one, you were getting better at fighting because you were getting practice, right? But you know what else was going down? You were judging each other, right? Human beings are always judging each other socially. Everyone. Even those clowns who say they're non-judgmental, they're judging each other on how judgmental they are, right? Like there's no getting away from it. Everybody's judging each other all the time. So when these three guys scrap with each other, right? Or they scrap with me, say, right? When I roll with him, he's like, ha, that guy, he's a chump. And then I roll with him, he's like, ha, man. And pretty soon, I've got a reputation as a chump, right? If I'm not very good at it. And, or vice versa, I could be a hammer. And he rolls with me, he goes, man, don't mess with that guy, I'll tear you up. And what happens is pretty soon, we start to know who's not to be messed with. Who's the person you want on your side when you get in a fight? We start to value it because we're doing it all the time. Because whatever it is that we're doing, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be judging each other on it, right? That's how it works. Okay? So that's what informal competitions do. Informal competitions, what they do is they spread competence throughout your organization because it's not socially acceptable to be incompetent. Right? And in the case of fighting, to not be tough. You get the idea, right? Now, it's important to note what is actually the standard. For example, when you get out to your unit, you must not fall out of any runs, right? But do you have to be the best runner to be respected? Is that what's going to happen? You get to your platoon and you're not the best runner, so... No. What do you got to do? What's the actual standard? You must not fall out of the runs, right? And you must be able to talk at the end. I mean, if you run with your platoon, at the end, you're the guy super gassed, right? That's not as bad as falling out, but it ain't that good either, right? But if you get to the end of the run with your organization and you can still talk to everybody, that's the standard, right? And the same thing is true of fighting. Do you have to be the best fighter in your unit to be respected as the leader? No, you do not. You have to be competent and you have to be tenacious. That's what you have to be. Right? Those are personal qualities that you must have to be respected in an organization of people who value fighting. I'll give you an example. We used to have this, when we first started this, our company commander was a guy named Castles, who later commanded a brigade in the 82nd, was a really, really good soldier, right? So he was a small person. When he was a captain, he probably weighed like 135 pounds. So when we were out there rolling all the time, he didn't win very much, right? So what do you think everybody thought of the guy? Everybody thought he was a monster because... He was tenacious as hell, right? And he was competent, he knew how to fight. But he was the commander and he was small, right? He didn't have as much time to train as everybody else, and he was a small person. So nobody expected him to be able to go out there and ball everybody up. But we definitely expected him to be out there with us, training, and to be tenacious, and to be competent. Right? Just exactly the same standard as the run. You see my point, right? That's what we expected of him. We expected him to be a warrior. Have that warrior mindset. That's what it means, right? That's what it means to value that. You get the idea, okay? So that's informal competitions, and that's an important thing to note, because when we do the midterms next uh, few classes, 
That's what it is. Even whether we're running it formally, it's an informal competition, right? Everybody must participate. There's the threat of humiliation if you get out there and you're terrible. And there's also the promise of public accolades. Everybody in the room could notice you're just crushing people, right? It was also an informal competition last class when we were practicing because that's what you were doing, judging each other, right? It's the same thing. Okay, so that's informal competitions. They spread competence throughout your organization. There's another type of competition, and that is formal competitions. And when I say that, what I want you to think is championships. Now, what do we get out of championships? I'd like to note that this organization here, right, USMA, this is like formal competition central. We have formal competitions for like all kind of crazy stuff, right? We have people doing competitions today, right now, all over the place. There's competitions going on, right? With that being said, why? What do we get out of it? Why would this organization place such a principle on formal competitions, right? So here I'll illustrate what they're about. Imagine that we were all down, we were just people who liked running, right? And we were all down at the river every day running and we all saw each other we were like, hey, what's up, you know? We were just uh, a group of us all down there. What if somebody came along and said, man, I wonder who the best runner is. Let's have a competition. What would happen? Some of us, the self-motivated types would start training for that competition, right? And they would become better runners because there was a competition than if there had not been one. So that's what championships or formal competitions do. They motivate the self-motivated to excellence. Okay, they give you a chance to achieve excellence, right? That's what they do. So the self-motivated people, which is a few people, that's the effect it will have, right? So I'll give you an example of that, right? When do you think was the first time in human history that somebody sat down and ate 50 hot dogs all at one setting? Like I would be willing to bet it was after somebody came up with the idea of a hot dog eating contest, right? And now even something as silly as hot dog eating, like it motivates people to train, right? There are people seeking excellence in hot dog eating right now that are training today because they want to be the best hot dog eater in the world. And you got people who can probably eat like 120 hot dogs or something all in one sitting because there's formal competitions for it. And it drives people to excellence, right? Okay, so that's the effect they have. Okay, now with that being said, there's other things going on too. So for example, anybody here fight in the uh, Brigade Boxing Open last year? Anybody? Okay, let's just imagine somebody did, right? What would they have gotten out of it? Well, we've discussed that. They would have gotten a chance to train harder, a reason to train harder, and they would have potentially gotten excellence out of it, right? But what did you get out of it, the Brigade Boxing Open? Or you? What did you guys get out of it? Maybe some entertainment, right? Okay, what else? Well, perhaps you've got experts within your ranks, okay? So for example, when the Army wants like the best units in the Army, when they want to become better shooters, what do they do? Who do they hire to help them become better shooters? They hire people who've proven their abilities in competitions, right? In my day in the Rangers, we used to hire like Jerry Bernhardt and Rob Latham and those guys who were action pistol shooters, right? Best guys in the world. And how do those guys become the best guys in the world? Competitions, right? They became the world champions. And in pursuit of excellence, they got really, really good skills and learned a whole lot of stuff about training that we could then get from them, right? So if you're a good leader, you could potentially tap into the experts within your organization in that way. And if you think about that on a larger scale, that's why we have all these kinds of competitions around here, right? We have robotics competitions. We have spelling bees. We have whatever, man. We have all kinds of stuff around here because we're giving each of you these little niches that you can prove your excellence in. There's a large organization. We need a whole bunch of really smart people who can be experts in a whole bunch of different stuff. You get the idea, right? Because that's the effect of formal competitions. Now, Competitions, that's the good side, right? They spread competence throughout our organization and they motivate some people to excellence, right? So that's what they do. And that's the good stuff, but there's also a bad side. The bad side is once you start putting rules on something, especially fighting, you start losing track of why you were doing it in the first place, right? When people are competing, they're trying to win, right? 
So for example, here's the result of that. In judo, right, what is the defense to the jab? Well, it turns out there isn't one, right? And why isn't there one? Because judo competitors are not training to win fights. They're training to win judo matches. And in judo matches, there's no strike. Right? What's the defense of the double leg takedown in boxing? Yeah, well, there isn't one. Because you can't do a double leg takedown in boxing matches. And boxers are training to win boxing matches, not fights. Right? What's the defense of the rear naked choke in wrestling? Well, there isn't one. Because in wrestling matches, you can't, win, you can't rear naked choke somebody. And wrestlers are training to win wrestling matches and not fights. You get the point, right? Whatever rules you put on something, people are going to start trying to win within those rules. And they're going to not train on stuff that doesn't help them win within the rules. Okay? And they're going to focus their training on that. I'll give you a good example of that. In wrestling, up until the 1936 Olympics, you could win wrestling in the Olympics, freestyle wrestling, by submission. The next Olympics after that were in 1948, so it was after World War II, right? And they got rid of submissions in their rules. And guess what happened? The entire wrestling world stopped training on how to break people's arms. Because you couldn't do it to win matches anymore, and they're training to win matches. Get the point, right? Okay, so, with that being said, I'll tell you a story to sort of illustrate it. Whenever the first Rage Battalion came back from Panama, we realized we had a lot to learn about close quarters battle, right? And close quarters marksmanship. So what you probably didn't know is that all the stuff we do for close quarters marksmanship in the Army came from the civilian world. It came from civilian competitions. The competition styles are called action shooting, right? If you can imagine the way they work, and so there's probably some people in here who take part in it, right? But the way they work is there's a, a make-believe gunfight. Like maybe you're a, a clerk at a 7-Eleven or something, and your gun is in the top drawer. And there's a target array that represents where the robbers would be. And there's a person behind you with a timer that has an audible beep for your go signal. And then it can hear your shot. So it can tell how long it took for you to, to run your string, right? So when you shoot your string of fire, they measure all the points you got on the targets and then divide it by how much time it took you. Okay? So then speed and accuracy count equally, similar to the way they do in real fights. Okay? So that was already going since the 60s. And whenever we, this we're talking about like in 19... You know, 90. So whenever 1990, when we started and went out and did that stuff, we brought that back into the Army. And it all spread throughout the Army from the Ranger Regiment, right? So with that being said, I was one of the people who was fortunate enough to go get training on this and whatnot. And when I came back from it, we started a shooting club at First Ranger Town. It was called the Sunday Night Slaughter, right? Every Sunday we got together, you know, go to church in the morning, come back that night, practice shooting people, right? And then, and then after a while, we started getting good at it, right? Because we're practicing all the time and everybody there was motivated by being better at combat, right? We wanted to win real gunfights. That's why we were doing it. So when we got good enough at it, we thought, oh, let's go fight in some of the, or shoot in some of the civilian tournaments. And so we did. And when we got out there, what we found out was no one else there was focused on winning real gunfights. What were they focused on? Winning the matches, right? Yeah, it's the exact same thing. So they had all kind of silliness, had non-tactical stuff that they were doing, like changing mags while they were running between cover and a whole bunch of other stuff like that. It was just like nonsensical stuff from the perspective of training for combat. Because that's the nature of competitions, right? They force people to excellence. But they're like a little bit off azimuth, if you get the point. And the longer you go off azimuth, the farther you get away from your objective. You know what I mean? So it's the same exact thing in all these competition styles. That's what separates combatives competition, by the way. All the other sports out there, when they change the rules on a sport, why do they change them? One reason would be safety, right? But another reason that they change the rules is to make it more exciting. Most of sports is the entertainment business, right? So when they change the rules from the NBA to NASCAR, it's one of those two things. They either want to make it safer for the participants or the fans, or they want to make it more exciting for the fans. Okay? So neither one of those things has anything to do with combat effectiveness, right? Okay, so therefore, when we change the rules in combatives, we change it specifically to motivate people to do the things that would win fights. Okay, if people are doing stuff that doesn't help you win fights, that's non-combative, the rules need to change. Because we need it, because that's the purpose of our stuff, right? Everybody kind of get the idea. Okay. Okay, so, so hopefully what I've illustrated here is that 
that these competitions have, the use of competitions is a tool to affect the value structure within your organization. Back to that chief of staff's uh, network of people, right? If that group was posting the scores and training, fighting together, so they were all rolling, I would have been able to ask that question and they all would have been able to say, oh yeah, this guy right here, he's the best shot. Oh yeah, this dude over here, he's the best fighter. See what I mean? So, so with that being said, what does it mean to have the warrior ethos? What does that even mean? Like we give it a lot of lip service, right? But what does it mean to say you have the warrior ethos? We say we have a warrior culture. What does that mean? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it means. It actually means this, okay? I demand of you that you be the sort of person that I need with me when I go through the door. I demand of you that you be a competent shot and that you know how to put a tourniquet on me in case I get shot. I demand of you that you get in the weight room and get as strong as you can because you might have to carry me off the objective and I'm big, right? I demand of you that you're the sort of person who I need leading the platoon on my flank. I demand it. And I demand it. And if you don't do it, I'm not going to respect you. In fact, I'm not even going to want you around me, right? That's what a warrior culture is. We demand it of each other, the things we need from each other in battle. And we build each other up, right? We motivate each other to do it. We're like, I want you to be better at X. I'm going to help you because my life might be on the line. And if my life isn't on the line, his might be, right? That's what a warrior culture is. And when we say we've got warrior values, man, what does it mean? That's what it means, right? What do we mean by values? Why do we have them? You know what I mean? Well, I'll tell you what they are. They're the things that make you better. Why do we value honesty, for example? Why, why is that something we would value? Because honest people, you should value it because honest people do better in life. Right? You should have that as an individual value because if you're an honest person, you're going to do better in life than if you're a liar. It's just the truth, right? We as an organization value honesty because if we're an organization where everybody's honest, we're going to be more competitive. We're going to be a stronger organization when we come against others. You see my point, right? That's what values are. That's what individual values are. That's what organizational values are, right? We value the things that make us more likely to be successful, right? Individually, that's all kind of stuff, right? Why do we value strength? Stronger people do better. Why do we value beauty? Beauty is a great example, right? Because it's not fair. Some people are beautiful. Some people are not. We still value beautiful, right? Even if we say we're fair, we're not fair on that regard. And beautiful people do better in life. Sorry that that's the truth, but it's the truth, okay? Now, as an organization, why do we have this list of values that we tell you you should have? Because we want a stronger organization. If you guys are honest and loyal, etc., we will be a stronger organization, right? That's why we demand it of each other. That's why we demand it of each other. I demand that you be an honest person, right? In the same way that I demand that you get in the weight room and that you become a better fighter and that you know how to shoot. You understand my point, right? Now, think about that from this perspective. What is our society, and I'm talking about our society here at the USMA and our society as an army. What does our society demand of us? What are the things that you need to do to get ahead? Let me illustrate my point here, okay? I know you guys have all heard the word chivalry, right? And I know you've all like think you probably know what it meant, right? Here's the part you probably didn't know. If you go look at the source material, you know what it wasn't about at all? It wasn't about any of the crap that people talk about it today. It wasn't about like you know, courtesy and how you would treat people and male and female relations and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't actually about any of that stuff. If you go look at the source material, it was really about 
what it says, right? The word chivalry, it means the way of the mounted warrior. Cheval means horse, right? So that's what it was, the way of a warrior. So I want you to imagine in that era how you would become rich and famous, right? We're talking about like the 13th century Europe, right? How would you become a wealthy person? Under feudalism, you came, became wealthy because somebody wanted you to be with them when they had to fight. Right? In exchange for you being a badass on their team, they gave you land. That's what chivalry was, right? So now, how did you become the sort of person that somebody would give land to so that you would be on their team? You had to prove yourself as a badass. And that's what chivalry was. How you proved yourself as a badass. You were a young man and you wanted to be in that group of people who would someday be rich and famous. You had to fight people, right? And they had it all laid out. You had tournaments. You had the joust. They were all rank ordered about how you could get better and better accolades, fight in local conflicts, fight in foreign wars, go on the crusades, whatever, right? They were all ways, things that you could do to prove you were the sort of person people wanted on their side. And then they would give you land and money. That's how it worked. Okay. So what I'm trying to illustrate, though, is every society has some similar incentive package, if you will, of what we demand of people. I'll give you a great example. We demand that you be scholars. We demand it because we need the army to be led by smart people. Right? So you must be a scholar. We selected you based on that, not just that, but among those other things, that, right? There is a list of things that... You, this situation we have demands of you. And if you do well at them, you will raise up. You see my point, right? And here's the thing, right? Most of the time, that stuff, a lot of it, just happens organically and nobody's even thinking about it. It just blossoms up, right? But if we're leaders, there are levers we can pull. And we can affect the value system of our organization, right? We can affect what people actually value. Not just giving them a list of platitudes that they need to memorize, right? I mean, things that they really value. And I want you to think about that from the perspective of your peers. What do they really value? What is the institution demanded of them? Not just the institution, the situation, right? What is the situation that you guys find yourself in that we've crafted as leaders here that you're going to be here for four years? What does it demand of you? What must you value to get ahead? Right? Because leaders think about that for their subordinates. Because you want them to be the sort of people you need them to be in combat. Right? You need them to be certain things. We as an organization need each other to be certain things, to believe certain things, to, to hold some things dear to us, right? For example, your intellect or your physical fitness or your warrior spirit, right? And that's on purpose. You have the ability to do that when you get out there to the force. You understand my point, right? How much time we got left? Five? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so that's what I want you to think about when we're fighting in here the next couple of classes, right? I want you to think about the fact that what's on display is your tenacity, which we need from you. We need you to be a tenacious person. Your competence, which we need from you. We need you to be a competent fighter, right? That's what's on display. Those attributes of you as a human being. That's why we're doing it. To encourage certain things in you that we need from you. As leaders. As warrior leaders of character. That's what it means. You get my point, right? So let's see it when you come back out.